being here, and I love being with this group of people, and I love the conversation we're about to have. Uh, we're going to be talking about the future of news in a way that is very pure, because it's about how we reimagine the craft, how we reinvent the practice using all the tools of technology to revive journalism as a driving force for the global public good. When you think of journalism 2.0, it's not a product, it's a process. And there are as many versions of it as there are practitioners in the field. It's about reinventing the way we communicate information and tell a good story. Journalism 2.0 is very much about a return to the public good. This notion of being user-centric, which we always should have been because we were always a service, but somehow we lost our way. So how do we create information and stories and background and context and knowledge? The beautiful introduction gave you a sense for, for what we believe, which is that it is holistic, that there's a sense that we need to help people get it. The journalist today is not just the reporter, it's the sense maker. How do we approach news as sense making in the digital age? It's transmedia, it's digital, print, radio, and how all those things fuse and how they achieve salience in a mobile and social world. Now, I think it's important to point out this notion of integrating all of the ingredients. The journalist as the person who puts it all together and engineers the aha moment. And the speakers we're gonna hear from today have done that uh, in incredible ways. It is a space full of startups because we all see and sense a massive opportunity to create something new. There's this notion we've had at News Deeply, which is that how you know when it's time to change the world? When you feel you can and you feel you must. And those of us who are practitioners in this domain, that's how we feel. So this whole future of journalism thing that gets kicked around in the industry press or covered occasionally in the tech press, it's a very personal battle, kind of like the samurais you were seeing earlier. It takes guts, it takes courage, and now it seems like a foregone conclusion that it's time to create something new. But when the three of us you're gonna hear from today, when we were all setting out into the void, uh, it was actually an uphill climb. It takes a lot of faith in your ability to create something better for the world. The two fantastic panelists we're gonna hear from today, Andy Carbon was a longtime senior strategist at NPR News. He's now with First Look Media, the uh, Piero Midiar's new global news startup. He showed us a new way to approach journalism during the Arab Spring. He was the, the curator par excellence, watching all of those social media streams coming out of the Arab Spring and helping a global audience make sense of it all. For that reason alone, and, and then consequently more, he's been called the crowd sorcerer. And we're gonna hear from him about how he envisions public participation, the age of network journalism. Our second panelist, Drake Martinet, is the head of platform at Vice News. It's a part of Vice Media that's now in public beta. He's been with the group for about a week. Before he was with Vice, he was with um, Now This News, before that with All Things D, and he's an incredible thinker at the intersection of product and editorial, which is a pretty awesome place to be. He also teaches at Stanford and Columbia University, so there's something rather professorial about the perspectives we're gonna hear, and I love it, because this is a space in creation. We're teaching it as we figure it out. I have been uh, very graciously invited to explain how I have experienced Journalism 2.0, my personal pivot, um, so I'm gonna do that, and I, I don't usually use myself as a case study, but uh, we're gonna do that today. Uh, we're just going to go back a few slides and tee that up. I'll give you a little bit of context while we wait for it to, to show itself to us. A couple of slides forward. This notion, this feeling that I have that the news is broken and that we have to put teams together to fix it. What do I mean by that? When this journey started, I was the girl on TV. I was a foreign correspondent for ABC News and Bloomberg Television covering the Middle East. It was a job I loved. ABC News sent me to the region when I was 25 years old with a camera and a backpack to cover the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I was passionate about the region and about everyone, how, however big or ever, however small that niche audience might be, anyone who was thirsty to get it, who wanted to understand that part of the world. So there I was with my camera, kind of doing my thing, having a great time, and I found this incredible uh, sort of momentum 
essentially being in our generation, this sense that my career was rising with the rise of Twitter, alongside it, as a part of it, within that fabric, and that there was a global conversation we were able to serve in a totally new way. And I would see Americans, I used to say, like, uh, my audience runs from uh, Riyadh to, uh, you know, to California, basically. Everyone from the edge of Arabia to the edge of the United States, the continental US, interested in this part of the world. I would hear from those people, they would ask me questions, they were fascinated about the Middle East and its evolution, and then its revolution. So a few slides forward, you get this view of the Arab Spring as it started to unfold. And it did unfold it across social media. Social media was the connective tissue that allowed people to organize and publicize what they were doing. So for those of us watching, we literally saw it unfold. First in Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia, the town where a young man set himself on fire and sparked it all to the January 25 Tahrir Revolution, the February 14th Bahrain Revolution, which became the Lulu Square Revolution, February 17 in Libya, February 20th in Yemen, and finally in Syria. Now because Syria came last in the uprisings, it got the least attention. And it wasn't really Syria's fault, and I knew that. This was a highly consequential country, a highly consequential story, and we'd lost the plot before it ever began. Those of us, even on my channels, I was reporting for ABC News and Bloomberg Television at the same time. We were fixated on Libya. We weren't really paying attention. It's almost like we could only stare at one thing at a given time. We had a tendency, yes, we're human. We run for the soccer ball, everybody at the same time. There's also this notion that linear television and traditional formats were not achieving what they needed to capture across this very complicated landscape. And it was no one's fault. It was just systemic. But there were factors that I was very keenly aware of as, as, as a thinker in the space. So basically, over time, we've seen a market failure in foreign news in the United States. And it's been a very simple equation. Essentially, bureaus have shuttered, reporters have been cut, both bureaus and reporters overseas are quite expensive, and the commercial pressure just caved in that model. And as a result, we saw foreign news gutted. In 2010, the number of stories in the foreign news pool had already been slashed to just half. So by 2010, we have half as much foreign news as we used to. And I noticed by then, we were already pretty much stopped covering the Iraq war. It was really sad. We had ceased to cover the war and we were still there. So I figured if we're not covering Iraq when we're there, or Afghanistan when we're there, then Syria didn't stand a chance. And it was a story that was important enough that I wanted my audience to, to understand it. So what happened? Syria escalated. And that market failure moved forward. Okay, we'll click through those real quick. As that sort of progressed, as the world got more complicated, but we had fewer people to cover it, the result was mass confusion, an uninformed society, an underserved audience. We wanted to take that audience from underserved to super served. And I think that in the digital age, you can find new ways to do that, and we had to go about it looking at how we would. So when it came to that huge debate over Syria and whether the US would strike last August, September, 45% of Americans say, said they didn't have enough information to even have an opinion about whether we should strike Syria in a country where we have a very low bar for having an opinion. So for me, that was really a signal that the knowledge pool was completely barren. And it was really sad. So. What we did, what we had started to do by then, was build a website called Syria Deeply. I wanted to create a single subject, in-depth news platform that would help people capture as much as they could about a given topic. And one that was very humble. One where we could basically, as we click through, give you a little tour of it. Everything from data mapping to Google Hangouts, <coughs> oops, everything that we could do to hack the news cycle. And people started to notice and gave us the kudos that we didn't expect because when we set out to do this, everyone thought we were crazy. Why would you work and focus on Syria right now? We're focused on fill in the blank. The US election, Gaza, Turkey. There was always another reason, but the fact is there's infinite real estate in the digital domain. Why wouldn't you allow for focus? Because people are really scattered right now. We're taking them all over the place with how we cover the news and no one really has a chance to digest what's going on. So we did that. And people said all these nice things, which again, it's actually the hardest thing for me to talk about here because um, we didn't expect, this is a social good, this is a social good moment in our, in our, in our 
life cycles. We, we thought that doing this would be a career killer. We thought that nobody would pay attention. And it turned out our instincts were right. What we thought the world needed was something they ended up thanking us for in spades. And that was a really important lesson for all of us on my team. And most importantly, when it came time to have that debate, they, the, the mainstream wheeled us out. They asked for our expertise. We connected them to sources on the ground. We gave them freely of information. All the content on our, on our platform is Creative Commons licensed. It was kind of like, here guys, here's what we've learned by sticking with it, by being consistent. Now, just please get it out there to the world. And we were able to do that. And that was our hack. So, you know, all these things like, I meant to go through that faster, but the point is, you know, the information itself got us, you know, to a more enriched knowledge pool. We held a Google Hangout with John Kerry and Nick Kristoff of the New York Times. He gave us 38 minutes right before going to Geneva to negotiate the nuclear deal between uh, Russia, Syria, and us, essentially. This notion that there is value now in, in consistency and in depth. So that's our service to the world. Our vision is that we're going to keep doing this, essentially. We're looking at other topics to do deeply, because as soon as we did ours, people came to us with their thing. And I, you know, people ask us, can you do oceans deeply, Arctic deeply, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at geographies, conflict zones, states in transition. <coughs> we're looking at strategic issues, everything from food deeply to refugees deeply. We should have been doing drought deeply and Ukraine deeply in the past two months. Hopefully we'll be doing that, have that bandwidth at some point technology and public health. Again, people coming to us and saying, will you do Alzheimer's deeply, robotics deeply? Because if we don't understand AI, then we're all going to be at a loss by the time it's too sophisticated for the layperson to understand. So that's who we are. And for each deeply, we felt we needed to do a teach deeply. Social studies teachers were using Syria deeply in the classroom. They wanted us to make it easier. So we turned everything we did on Syria deeply into an open lesson plan for social studies teachers at the middle and high school level so that they could find ways to explain to their students what's going on in the world. As soon as we did that, it was endorsed by the National Council for the Social Studies. They spread it out to all their teachers. Their teachers came back to us and said, can you please do Teach Afghanistan next? Because so many of our kids have parents deployed in Afghanistan, and we can't explain to them why. When the news fails, our public good dissolves. A, a very vital public good dissolves. And our teachers are no longer in a place where they can teach what's happening in the world. And that puts all of America at a disadvantage. So this is our hack. Teach Afghanistan is coming next in September. And we'll be doing more, uh, more, more teach deeply as each deeply stands up. It's all about keeping our commitment to the story. It's all about how we serve people on both ends of the story. And everything we can deploy around that, whether it's a tool of technology, or having dedicated reporters, or finding new ways to work with people on the ground, we have more than a dozen Syrians writing for us inside the country in their native Arabic. We don't treat them like fixers and assistants. We treat them like journalists, and we teach them the craft. So many of the journalists we worked with in Iraq now can't find a job. They get emails all the time from them. Can you help me find a job for an oil company? I know you have, you know, we left them behind. We left them without the skills to keep going. You know, there are people. This is, this is about, in the end of the day, it's about how we live together on planet Earth. And journalism is the connective tissue. So if we're not, Raising the game and rethinking the craft, we are not going to be able to serve in the 21st century.